Hello, everyone, and welcome to season seven of the BizHack Live Digital Marketing Masterclass Series. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy and today's host. Season seven focuses on how to plan for success in 2023. And there's no better way to plan for success than to quote an old timey white dude giving good advice. Henry Ford said, a man who stops advertising to save money is like a man who stops a clock to save time. The reason I wanted to share this with you is because there's a tendency when we face a physical storm like we're having right now in South Florida or an economic storm that we're all living with and preparing for in 2023, there's a tendency to hide, to stop spending money on marketing. It's the first thing that tends to get cut and to try to retreat in a position of cash saving and not investing. The truth of the matter is, as Henry Ford said, now is the time to invest in growth because you can grab market share from your competitors. That is the opportunity that we're looking at in 2023. And we're here today to help you all prepare for the best 2023 possible. We're offering a series of four masterclasses in strategy for how to develop strategy and prepare yourself for the coming recession. Last week, we talked with the venture mentoring team about the lean startup methodology and the red ocean, blue ocean approach to finding growth opportunities. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics in all of strategy, which is EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, by far the hottest small business operating system out there today. You're going to learn from Liz Mershon and Michelle Molina about how EOS works, and you're going to get an in-depth case study of how it applies to a small business. And if you use the EOS process, you're going to have much higher levels of accountability and a clear sense of prioritization. And you're going to stop the insanity and eliminate the chaos that you many of you have in your small businesses. So strap in. We're going to get ready to go with Liz and Michelle uh, to talk about EOS. I wanted to first, as always, acknowledge our amazing partnership with the Office of the Mayor of Miami-Dade County and her Th Strive 305 initiative, and welcome our partner in crime, Danilo Vargas, from the Mayor's Office. Welcome, Danilo. Hey, thank you, Dan, um, for that great introduction. Uh, I want to thank you and the whole team at, at uh, BizHack and our speakers today and everybody who's on the call today. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this exciting second class of Season 7. And you know, Dan, one of the things that I've um, kind of realized in my travels and helping small business owners is that a lot of times it can seem like marketing is a bit of a guessing game. But in reality, it, it isn't. There's some science to it and it helps tremendously when you have a system or some sort of model that you can follow that kind of tells you from Monday morning what you should be working on. So uh, as you mentioned, you know, we're living already in challenging economic times and these challenges may get bumpier and bumpier as 2023 approaches and, and continues, right? So at the mayor's office, Mayor Daniela Levine Cava wants to make sure that every small business owner in Miami-Dade County continues to be supported and continues to have the opportunity to learn how to be a master marketer. If there's one topic, this is my favorite topic as well, uh, Dan, Marketing is that key to your success. It's the difference between that one company that has one location and that other company that has 10 locations, right? That marketing piece is so critical and it's the best kind of funding that you can find from your, for your business, happy paying customers that allow you to have a profit. So I'm not, I'm not a, a big uh, expert on EOS. In fact, I know only the rudimentary aspects of it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to taking some notes and, and learning a lot today, Dan. So thank you and thank you everyone. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're, we welcome that you're here today and thank you again, you know, for your support. We also wanted to thank our media sponsor, South Florida PBS and the Health Channel, and, and all of the incredible promotional partners who have helped spread the word to their members uh, about this important series. Many of you know me already, but in case you don't, uh, I'm a business storyteller. 
CEO and founder of BizHack Academy, creator of the lead building system. And for nearly 20 years, uh, I was a journalist and storyteller for the Miami Herald, Washington Post. And what I've really done in the last decade of my career is bring purpose-driven storytelling to incredible, incredible businesses like Michelle Molina's and many of the others who've gone through our programs. As I mentioned, um, we're doing a four-part series on strategy. As a thank you for coming here today, you're gonna get a follow-up email with a link to a recording of today's session. It's gonna be posted on our YouTube channel. You're also gonna get some exclusive handouts and additional resources provided uh, by the folks at EOS, by Liz. We're get, you're gonna get automatically registered for the upcoming master classes, and you'll get reminders about those. And you're gonna also get information about our underserved business scholarship program. This is for women-owned businesses and BIPOC-owned businesses. This is part of the small way in which we to try, get, try to give back to support the diversity and inclusion of our incredible community. And Danilo is part of the diversity and inclusion office at the Miami-Dade Mayor's office. You know, we're, we have two extraordinary um, women entrepreneurs who we're gonna be featuring in today's session. And, um, you know, I myself uh, am the son uh, of an immigrant from Spain, uh, self-identify as Hispanic and BizHack is a MBE certified with the state of Florida. So we are all part of an ecosystem of support and we're very proud at BizHack to be giving women and BIPOC-owned businesses uh, some extra love uh, to help take advantage of our training. Today, we're going to be talking about the hottest small business operating system, EOS. We're going to be joined, we are joined by Liz Mershon. Liz is with The Profit Recipe. The Profit Recipe is a firm that specializes in providing professional implementation services of EOS to businesses like Michelle. Michelle is one of Liz's clients. And Michelle, uh, Liz has an incredible background herself as an entrepreneur. She's the multi-unit franchise owner of Nothing Bunt Cakes. She was a founding men member of the Oliver Pyatt Center, where she turned an eight-bed eating disorder program into a multi-site facility in just five years. And she contributed to the growth of Montanitos, 22 national facilities. And she has helped establish South Florida's premier independent television studios for clients such as Discovery, NBC, Telemundo, and Columbia TriStar. So she has, uh, like me, a broadcast background. Mm -hmm. Michelle Molina and I met when we were together uh, on the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. And we spent almost half a year uh, side by side uh, in that extraordinary program. It's a free program for businesses of $150,000 in revenue or more. It's highly competitive to get in. It's sponsored by Goldman Sachs and the curriculum comes from Babson College. And I don't know about you, Michelle, but that was an incredible experience that we had together. Yeah, it definitely was. She's the founder of M3 Roofing and she has an incredible passion for providing shelter to people. Uh, through uh, high quality, fairly priced, expertly integrated roofs. And she's also the secretary treasurer of the BNI chapter of Miami Dade. And she uh, got her bachelor's and master's from FIU. I also got my master's from FIU and go Panthers. <laughs> so I want to hand it now over uh, to um, Liz to talk a little bit about what is EOS? What is the entrepreneurial operating system? Um, and, and how can it help entrepreneurs like Michelle as they're trying to get ready for 2023? Sure, let's start sort of from the beginning, right? Because it was birth uh, by an entrepreneur himself named Gino Whitman, who has written several books, including one called Traction, which is uh, who many many people uh, recognize because it sold millions of copies. Um, Gino started his entrepreneurial journey at the tender age of 21, and just a few years later, um, took over family business. And when it was in in the middle of a turnaround, and he turned that company around in three years, and continued to work um, in the company, just you know, growing the company and was there for seven years. Um, he ultimately wound up selling the business and stayed on for another year and a half um, through the transition of that sale to the leadership team, for the leadership team. And um, during that time, he and nine other um, 
founders, owners, started the EO chapter in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And it was there that he met many other um, entrepreneurs, leaders like himself, and started helping them and realized he had a real knack for the science of business and started cobbling together what we know now as the entrepreneurial operating system. The beauty of the program, the system is that it's such a simple system. It's, it's, there's no, there's no magic pill. There's no silver bullet. These are systems. These are tools that have been tried and true. They've been going, they've been used for many years and many years to come. And uh, what we're going to do today basically is I want to give an overview of those components of those biz the business, because Part of the discovery was that as leaders, as entrepreneurs, we all wrestle with 136 issues simultaneously, like a lot of stuff going on. But at the root of all these problems, really it's derived from these six components that, um, that EOS is made up from. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down each of these components. And later on, we're gonna go through the case study with Michelle of how each of these components uh, apply in the business. But first I wanna just give you sort of a, a top sure. of, of what each of them, you know, what they represent. So right, perfect. So before we, I'm gonna pause you there. Before we get to that, uh, I wanna just talk a little bit in the more general sense of what is EOS and how it impacts people's lives. And then uh, I promise we'll get into the six elements. So Michelle, um, before and after EOS, how has your entrepreneurial life, how has your life as the uh, one of the owners of M3 Roofing changed by bringing EOS into your business? In a nutshell um, overview, it, it really just helped organize all the thoughts and ideas that we had in our head as business owners into one unified system and one that I could then roll out to teams. Because a lot of times as business owners, we have all the ideas, we have all the processes in our head, and then we just expect others to, to know, like they're mind readers. Um, and this just really helped just bring all that together and then roll it out as one, one message for the team. Now, now, I know you from when we worked at 10KSB, and you're, you're a pretty focused, hardworking, you know, organized owner. Um, did this system actually make you even more focused and organized? It, it did a hundred percent. I actually think that it gave me the proper tools that I needed that I just didn't have. You know, you set out on this path of entrepreneurship and then how, how do you know how to do the things that, that you feel are correct? So it's the tools, it's the, it's the meeting polls, it's the, the vision and the, and the mission and the ability to be able to roll it out to everybody. And uh, we're going to go through those tools and you're going to see how it all kind of fits together into a whole, but I'm curious just from a, an emotional standpoint, like how do you feel running your business today compared to before? Do you feel more control and confidence? Like what is the emotional experience of, of running the business? It, it's, I mean, I don't know because we really recently realized that we wanna open a multi-site, um, that's like our vision. You'll see that later on. Um, but I definitely feel it, it's calming because it just feels like everybody is on board and and um, I feel like things are in the right place. And you'll see them, right? When we talk about issues and rocks, mm -hmm. things are in the right place in an organized fashion. Um, and so I'm definitely feel like there's, there's progress, there's traction, we'll talk mm -hmm. about traction too, um, and momentum moving forward in, in, in the right way. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I will be able to talk a little bit on a personal level uh, later during this session about EOS and how it's impacted BizHack because we use the system to run our business and we use it with our clients. So I'll definitely be piping in as we go because I'm, I'm, I'm a very kind of you know, we're two years into the our EOS journey and it's been really impactful for us. And so I can provide a little bit of that. I did want to just quickly share about a little personal anecdote about how this all began for me. Um, and the, the journey begins uh, 10 years ago. I was working at Liberty Power, a billion dollar energy company as its head of marketing. And I just hired a new firm, a new di digital marketing agency to work with us. And as a thank you gift for hiring them, they gave me this book. It's Traction by Gino Wickman. And guess what I did? I stuck it on my shelf and <laughs> forgot about it. 
10 years, <laughs> 10 years go by, literally 10 years go by. The thing was written, I think in like 12 years ago. So it's like 10 years ago, I get the book. It's like hot off the presses. It's people like very few people knew about it back then. I stick it on my shelf and I forget about it. And then I'm in the midst of COVID and I'm honestly pretty depressed about my business. I'm feeling overwhelmed and overmatched. Uh, those of you who might remember, I started this BizHack Live series um, about a month after COVID caused us all to go into quarantine. And um, I, I was feeling kind of you know, I had been an in-person training company. I was feeling very isolated. I was a little scared. And we used the BizHack Lives, which we were giving, you know, for free and with a spirit of generosity to the community as a way to just connect at a time when we were all really scared and confused about what was happening. You know, my business was on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, we had to go from in-person to online training. We had no idea. We had to cancel our in-person trainings. We, we were running out of money and we had no idea if people were going to take courses with us online. Well, it turned out they did and things went okay. But around that time, I discovered this book, <laughs> Rocket Fuel. And Rocket Fuel, okay, is also by Gina Wickman, but it's a book specifically about a very particular relationship between the visionary CEO and the integrator head of operations. And the argument that Gina Wickman is making in Rocket Fuel is that if you have a visionary CEO paired with a organized integrator, your company is on Rocket Fuel. And the problem is most businesses are started by visionary CEOs who frankly have ADHD. They have bright, shiny object syndrome. They see opportunities everywhere and they want to do them all at once. And as a result, they do nothing. They don't get anything done. There's a lot of starts and not a lot of finishes. And so when I read this book, I'm like, oh man, I am clearly a visionary and I need me an integrator. So I went on a search for an integrator and it took me six months to hire one, but she transformed my business. So that's how. EOS came to me. It came to me in a moment of need. And I'm very, very thankful for it. Like this honestly got me through one of my darkest periods as an entrepreneur and frankly, as an adult. Uh, and it gave me a sense of a roadmap of what I needed, what was missing. If you're that entrepreneur who just feels like it's, it's like you're running on a hamster wheel, but not getting anywhere. The reason why is probably because you're a visionary and you need an integrator. And I then discovered this book on my bookshelf one evening and I'm like, oh, and I started to read it and it's like a textbook. And so then I heard about this other book and this is actually where most people kind of start with their EOS journey, which is called Get a Grip. And it's like a fable. They call it a fable. It's like the story version of this textbook. So they introduce us to a fake company and then they tell us about how they implemented this to get their lives on track. Now, I'm a creative writer and former journalist, and this book is a boring story. It's a story about people in meetings, right? But nonetheless, it's way more interesting than reading a textbook, and so a lot of people like it. So Get a Grip is where a lot of people start. My goal with the next you know, hour or so that we have together is to give you basically a version of what you'll get in this book but with a much more interesting person, which is a real life Michelle Molina and M3 Roofing, <laughs> right? So that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a real life fable, a real life story of how EOS is transforming one of South Florida's most uh, innovative and important roofing companies. And Liz is gonna be our guide through this. She is what is known as their implementer. And if I'm not mistaken, Michelle, you're your company's integrator and your husband is your visionary. Yes. Okay. So we're going to, so we're, we're talking right now to a consultant, Liz, who is an implementer professionally of this with Liz and many other companies. Um, BizHack chose to self-implement, 
which means I studied these books and I read up, read up on it. And then I hired an integrator who was in-house. I hired a Michelle, in other words, and, and we kind of stumbled along. And I can definitely give the self-implementation perspective today, which is basically it takes longer and it takes and it has it's a lot a long of journey. <laughs> you know, we actually have a joke at BizHack. We're a training academy, and I like to say there's two ways to learn: <laughs> my way or the hard way. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, basically trying to self-implement is the hard path. Yeah. Uh, the path that Michelle is taking is the is the more time efficient path. It does require a money investment, but she's getting so much further faster than we did because she's investing in professional help in, in a consultant. So um, I hope that's a good setup for you, Liz, to talk about, you know. Sure. Yes, I want to I want to add two things. One is uh, we didn't mention that Michelle's company will tell them what you won recently. Oh, yes. We were um, honored by the South Florida Business Journal as one of the 50 fastest growing companies for yeah. 2022. So, yeah. So, and I, and I have to say in six months, um, they, and we'll go through the vision, but they had a, they had a vision to open up a second location. And next thing I know, I'm getting a text that they won this thing and they're opening up a second location. <laughs> I was like, wow, that I kind of believed it really worked. So, and I want to add one more thing before we jump on that, um, that whole visionary integrator relationship. Um, the behavioral health company that I helped found and, and we sold to private equity and it's it's one of the top uh, in the in the industry. One, I think it's number one or two in the industry. Um, oddly enough, I was introduced to EOS uh, through a friend because we were in rapid growth mode and it was chaotic. And it turned out that we had this already natural visionary integrator relationship already in the company, which was my CEO and myself, which is I was a COO. And once we implemented EOS, that allowed us to go from that five bed to that multi, you know, multinational, multi-site national company um, because of that relationship. So to your point, um, that that relationship is key. And we'll talk about it a little more down the road. But uh, thank you for sharing that, Dan, because it really is important. <laughs> I tell people all the time, visionary is not the same as an integrator. They're two completely different people. So now going back to like the vision, let's start with the components and I'm going to take a very high level approach first and then we'll kind of dig into the tools but let's start with the vision the vision is essentially just getting everyone um I think we're in the wrong slide can we go to the next slide guys um yeah thank you so the vision let's go to the slide that has all the components please if you don't mind because we're going to go there we go that's perfect we can just do that okay so the vision component is essentially getting everybody on the same page of where you're going and how you're going to get there, right? Making sure that everyone is clear about the direction everyone has got to row. So that is the vision. And then we talk about the tools are, we use two, two uh, well, a tool that we call the vision tracker organizer, which we're going to get into with Michelle later, where we go through a series of questions that we, we answer. And from that, we move forward. So then we talk about the people component. Well, we know that you can't build a great company without great people, but how do you define great people? Because that looks different in every organization. So again, we, we use tools to use a concrete sort of black and white approach to what makes great people in this organization, your organization. And then we also talk about the right person and the right seat, because it's important not just to have the right person, but that they're sitting in the right seat. And again, we'll get in, into the more of the nitty gritty later. The data is just basically running your business on facts, not feelings. These are numbers, right? So that you know what the levers are so that you can be predictive and you can't measure something that you don't have, right? So you need the numbers to be able to measure how you're doing. And we use two tools. We call the scorecard and measurables. Now, if you can envision a, a company with a clear vision, great people and data, what happens is you start creating this organization which becomes lucid, transparent and issues surface, right? What are issues? They're simply just challenges, obstacles, things that need to be removed or, or resolved in order to realize those vision, that vision. So we create an issues list where all that stuff that's in your head goes on paper and then we work on solving those issues with a system we call IDS, identify, discuss, and solve. 
And again, we'll talk about that a little more. And then you've got process, which is simply taking your core processes. Every company has, you know, core processes, marketing, sales, uh, your finance, which is accounting, um, and you just document it. But we do it in a very simplified approach, which is, you know, instead of writing the 50 page SOP, we take the 20, 20% 20 of the 80% and then create master checklists so that it's simpler to follow because let's face it, no one reads those manuals and that's the truth. Um, and then when we, when we get to the bottom, right? It's traction. What is traction? It's all about discipline, accountability so that we can execute on the vision. And it's no coincidence that vision's on top and traction's on the bottom because in EOS we say, Vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> so we want to make sure we're executing on this vision. And but in order to do that, we need to instill right discipline and accountability in our team so that everyone is aligned and that we all know what we're trying to achieve. And that's really the six components. And now what we're going to do is we're going to work with um, with Michelle to go through each and one every one of those. And we're going to start with vision and. What we, we use is called the Vision Tracker Organizer, and we go through a series of questions. So first and foremost, we talk about core values, and, and I'm going to do this, just run through it, and then we're going to look at Michelle, um, which is M3's Vision Tracker Organizer, and the information they have in their Vision Tracker Organizer. So core values, well, we know that you hear this term, most people know this term, but it's not just about putting words um, up on, you know, up on your walls. It's really about what are the behaviors, what are the characteristics, what are the values of the people in your organization? What's the culture you want to create? And we go through an exploration to really define what that is for you, because the truth is that it, it, it doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. Um, then we look at the core focus. You know, what do you, what is your sweet spot? What do you do great, right? And and why do you do it? So that you're not um, you're not tempted to go after shiny objects. I think you know uh, Dan might have said that earlier because if you stick to your core focus, that's that's what you do great, right? We want to keep you there. That's your niche. Then we look at your BHAG, your big, all hairy, audacious goal. And sometimes people do 10 year, sometimes five years. In, in M3's case, they wanted to go five years. So what do, what do we want to, what do we want to reach for in five years? And it's just, this is just like, um, you know, sort of that big, big uh, goal you want to achieve. We want to have do 10,000 roofs, right? We want to have service 10,000 clients. That's, it's that simple, right? We take a very simplified version to this business plan. And then we 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 have your target market, right? Who, you know, what's the geographic, psychographic, demographic of your ideal client? And what do we say to them? Like, what are your differentiators? What's going to make you different than your competition? So this is all part of the exploration, the work that we do together. And then the proven process and guarantee, some companies have that, others don't. We have ours and we'll show you at the end, but that's something that you decide whether that applies to your business or not. Then we look at the three-year picture and here we, we kind of start looking ahead. We set a future date, a future revenue, what we want to see is profit. What are those measurables, right? And then what does that look like? And we really go through a you know visualization of, Three years from now, where do we see ourselves? What do we want to achieve? What does it look like? You know, we want to be doing company retreats. We want to be able to, uh, in Michelle's case, we're going to go through it later, but they had some very specific things they want to achieve in three years. So again, that applies, that looks differently for, for different companies, depending on what your goals are. Um, in, in Michelle's case, one of them was to be less involved in the business, right? Have be more hands-off. That was very important to them. So then we move on to uh, the next part of the, the, the process was this is all about execution, right? So we start with a one-year plan. What Let's look ahead one year from now. What are the main, what are the top goals that we want to achieve, right? And we, we really, the, the whole approach to EOS is less is more. Let's keep it simple, right? So we do three to five typically, you know, seven is the max. And we, what are the mo what are the things that need that we want to see happen in the next year that we want to achieve? And then we break it down to quarters, right? And we call those quarterly rocks. 
And those rocks are the three to five top things, right? We, we have seven here, but again, I, I usually say less is more, but we, we choose those rocks. What are the things that must happen this next quarter for us to move the needle towards achieving the one-year plan? And we get very specific about what that looks like. And the last thing we do is take, put down all the issues. Okay, let's, let's do like a, it's like, it's like business therapy. Like, let's get all that stuff that's in our head down on paper, right? Because you don't realize all the stuff that you're dealing with that you just assume that it's either known or getting handled, but you put it on paper. And these are the, the challenges, the obstacles, the roadblocks that we need to prioritize to make sure that we're, again, knocking them down, moving the needle towards that, those quarterly rocks that are then going to feed into the one-year plan that ultimately feed into the three-year and five-year and so on, right? So that is the issues list. And we prioritize them, we identify them, discuss them, and solve them. Now, what we're going to do is we're so, going to... <laughs> I would, if you don't mind, I would like to do just a quick personal reflection on how I've come to interpret the VTO. And mm -hmm. then we're going to actually talk about um, Michelle uh, and her case study. So, um, so this is the vision. This is the traction. This is the kind of big ideas, this is the execution. Yeah. And when you talk about core values, and actually in session four, we're gonna be joined by Jennifer Hudson and she's gonna talk about the importance of core values because that is the identity of the company. Yeah. The core values are who you as a business are. They're all about you. The core focus is what good you're going to do in the world as a result of who you are. So the core focus is more outward facing. This is the change in the world we want to affect. The core values is more about who are we doing that change making. That's why you always start with core values, because you want to start with identifying who are you, what do you value, what is meaningful to you, how do you work as a team, how do you organize yourselves? And then how do you express that in the world through impact? That's core focus. 10-year target is what is the concrete change we want to make? And the marketing strategy is how we're going to tell the world about it. And the three-year picture is what is the stop along the road to that big change we hope to make? So that's what the vision is. It's who are we? What do we want to do in the world? And how are we going to get there? How are we going to get noisy about it? And what's the stop along the road? And, you know, they sometimes say, you know, the BHAG is a 10-year target. It can be seven years. It's not, it doesn't matter. It could be the three to five-year picture. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is you want to define where you're headed in the long term and what is a kind of ambitious midpoint for that longer goal. And by the way, next week, we're going to, uh, next session, we're going to talk with someone from Pinnacle which is a comp competitor to EOS. Last week, we talked about the lean startup. There's also scaling up. There, there honestly are dozens of systems like EOS that are out there that are, frankly, good at, other, good at some things, less good at others, but, but they all are organized. The vision is all organized in the same way. Who are we? What do we care about? And what are we trying to achieve in the world that will make the world a better place? It, it really is that simple. Then. What is the operating system? How do you get traction? Like, how are we gonna actually get this done? That's what this is about. And everybody's organized the same way as well. You have one year goals, quarterly goals, and then you have, as you're gonna learn, like a cadence of meetings, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, to accomplish these goals that you've laid out. And we're gonna walk you through all that here. So let's now go to Michelle. And let's talk about who is Michelle and M3 Roofing and what are they trying to do in the world? Michelle? Yeah, so specifically talking about the core values, before we started EOS, we already had core values um, as a team that Xavier, my business partner, and I uh, had created. But what we realized, we had like six or eight of them, right? They were great, but it was a lot of them. And so when we went through the, the vision tracker organizer and we talked about like the core values, when we did that exercise, we realized that there was like a common theme in all of them. 
And so we condense them into four main core values. Um, within the office, we have like each core value has two lines of just how the team, um, you know, is it, you know, how we as a team uh, okay. behave, right? Or align for the customer. Um, but this allows us to now speak these core values in our meetings, in our uh, quarterly goals, when we sit down with uh, the team, um, when we do performance reviews, they're all integrated into all of those moments. So it's so M3 is a being. It's got a, it's got life. It's got breath, and 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 people understand that that's that that's what we're trying to do. Um, same with the core focus. We we always we always decided our mission was always like to break the mold within the service industry. But what we realized what we were doing was not only breaking the mold, but we were disrupting the industry. Um, and so we going through the exercise, we we changed it. And when we changed it, it just felt better. I was like, yeah, that's what we're doing. I'm not breaking the mold. I'm disrupting the industry um, um, by providing excellence and transparency. So I really love the way it shit. We had it. We always had it. Um, but we shifted it and now it's it's even better. It's exactly who we are. It yeah. Was a cool discovery process, right? So even though they had some of this stuff already, because they had worked with someone before, it was just a deeper exploration where it wasn't as surfacy. We really dug deep. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, that's what that's what they sat where it felt right. right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and I want to actually dig in here a little bit because. The core values, um, what's really important is their meaningful language. In other words, that inside of your company, you know exactly what be innovative, have the spirit of excellence, we are invested in loving accountability means. And there needs to be a shared understanding of that. And the only way you can accomplish that, how many um, employees do you have, Michelle? We're now at uh, 13. And I imagine a lot of these folks are probably like hard hat types who are out there in the field all the time. Right. Yeah. Some are administrative in the office and then there's more out on the field. So, right. They're, they're scattered. So, so how do you get the guy who's like on a hot tar tacky roof all day to understand what these core values mean? Well, through the process of EOS, we've been able to cultivate and develop a leadership team. Yeah. And each leader that sits in our Monday morning meeting um, is it represents a department within the company. So there's an operation, there's a field, um, and then it's my visionary and myself, Xavier and myself in those meetings. And so what I do is you start from the bottom and then it trickles on its way down. And then when we have these quarterly meetings, it's a gathering of, of everybody. The top of exactly. Um, but right, but starting from the top and working down is, is how we've been able to maintain the core values. And, and the thing about core values, and I learned this from Jennifer Hudson, is that each core value basically is vivified by behaviors. Great. So let's let's do a concrete one. Loving accountability, yeah. or we are invested. I'm a roofer with a hard hat on a tacky roof working for you. Right. How can I live the core value of we are invested or loving accountability what's a behavior that one of your roofers would show that shows they're living by that core value right so one of the specific ones that we use on the field i'm sorry to change you but to be innovative just specifically means that um when they're up on that roof if they have a way to um, you know, a new installation or a new product, or if they think that, hey, the slope of this roof or the material that we're currently using, and they they bring about the idea to make it better, um, that's the one we really use out on the field is, is to be innovative. Like, just don't do the status quo. Don't go out there because they said, oh, I'm going to install this and that's what I'm going to do. Um, if they see that something can be done better or, or a material you know, an installation can go a different way that's going to better protect a roof for the homeowner. That's the one we really... Um, which leads into homeowner. spirit of excellence. Correct, right, which leads... I mean, I love the spirit of excellence um, because the spirit... I mean, I the team is expected to have a spirit of excellence in any interaction that they have within a homeowner or within ourselves um, as a team. So, I mean, yeah. I love homeowner, which, what, which then, like, if you think about it, you know, allowing that to happen, then that shows that you're invested, right? Because if you care enough to bring that up, something that could improve and, and, and 
what you're doing. You're right. now you're now living that we are invested, right? Right, right. Which you feel now accountable for like the success of it. And the leading in the last one, loving accountability, you know, to me for so long, I don't know why accountability sometimes has like a negative connotation to it, right? Like you you feel like, oh, I did something wrong or I didn't do it the right way. So we labeled it as loving accountability because the team has to realize that M3 has a goal and, and that goal is to to make a better experience for the customer by disrupting the industry. And it's just a matter of, you know, what are the goals and, and are we aligned? And, and if it's not, and if it's something that you didn't get to do, why is, you know, we go down like that, you know, pro is it a system? Is it a process? Do you need more training? Um, and then we hold you lovingly accountable towards those. Yeah, at BizHack, one of our core values is blameless problem solving. There you go. which I think has the same kind of idea at its heart, which is we're going to make mistakes, we're going to mess up, and blamelessly, we're going to figure out how to do better next time. Right. Uh, and it's hard to live up to that, right? Like sometimes you're like really in that annoyed that something didn't get done the way you wanted. But if you can take that spirit of blamelessness, it just allows people to feel safe and make mistakes and know that they're not going to get their head chopped off, just that they need to be held accountable to do better next time. Now, what I want to, um, uh, one last question before we move on from core values is, do you have any system of recognizing, catching people doing good? Do you have any like system or awards or bonuses or any system to kind of reward people who live by your core values? Well, yes. Since implement, since going through EOS, one of the things we've implemented are uh, monthly team gatherings, 30 minutes, once a month, where we call out a team member that is living the core value. Um, we've also empowered the, the leadership team that if they catch somebody doing a good thing, um, we're going to implement like that kudos system. Yeah. There's like a, there's like an app that, you know, each team member has and they can give kudos like, okay, this person did a good thing and they get points and based off those points, they get rewards. So yeah, I want to catch people doing, living the core values because it'll motivate them to keep, keep living. <laughs> That's how you reinforce, you know, I have little kids and what they teach you when you're trying to train kids and it's true with dogs as well is catch them doing good and encourage it and ignore them as much as possible when they're not. Now, before we move on, I want to talk about core focus and specifically disrupt the service industry. Okay. That means a lot to you. It doesn't mean too much to me. So what I want you to do is describe what the service industry is today that you're trying to disrupt? In other words, what do you stand in opposition to? Um, you know, the, the, the service industry for a long time, especially, I feel like Miami is a very special niche of service providers. Um, there's some really amazing ones out there, but for a long time, you know, especially when you say roofing, they think, oh, or construction, they're going to steal my money. They're not going to show up when, when they say they're going to show up, you know, they're going to be late. They're not going to speak English. Roofers especially have a negative connotation of they're going to be up on my roof and napping on my lawn. You know, there's there's a lot of that going on. And so for us to disrupt the service industry, it's, you know, it's showing up 30 minutes prior to arrival. Well, it's texting them, letting them know I'm going to be 30 minutes um, prior to the arrival. Um, before we get there, they get an appointment confirmation and they have a picture of their trusted roofologist that's going to show up. So the person that they're expecting, they already know who this person is. Um, before they get there. Um, and it's just, I think of everything from the from the customer journey, you know, and, and another one of our uh, three uniqueness, which you'll see later on, we discovered is that we tell customers what they need to hear and not what they want to hear, um, which is sometimes hard, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not. No. Gonna... There, there's nothing worse than being lied to by your contractor. Right. Uh, let me ask you this. You're a woman in a sometimes male dominated world. And I'm curious if that's part of what you mean by disrupt the service industry. Um, you know, what I realized then when I took your class two years ago is that um, it's in my blood. I'm a third generation co contractor. My grandfather and my father are electrical contractors. My brother's a general contractor. Now my husband's a roofing contractor. Um, and I was always instilled in me by the golden rule, you treat others how you would like to be treated. So to me, it's not about a, you know, it, it, it's a, it's, it's what it says there, excellence and transparency. Um, it's, it's what I live every day, teach my kids. I've got three little ones and um, 
it's what I teach the team. So. So, so you're living the values that your grandfather and your father and your husband live and yeah. your gender is secondary. Correct. All right. But it is a male dominated industry. Yeah, so, it is. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it alone after this, but I'm just curious as a woman in a male dominated industry, do you have any reflections about that? And do you think it changes or affects how you run the company? I I don't. I think it does need to change. I don't think there's enough women in construction. Um, I don't think they give enough credit to women in construction. I think women bring a different perspective um, to different fields, specifically in construction. So, Perfect. Now let's talk about your marketing strategy, your target market, and your differentiators. Right. So my marketing strategy, um, I think this is where at the beginning you asked me about my EOS experience. These were things that we always knew we did, but it wasn't ever written down somewhere or in a very organized and, uh, um, you know, thought out process. And I just recently hired a marketing coordinator and it made it so much easier that when I did hire her, I'm like, hey, you know, this is how we look and, and we make a lot of decisions based off of this. Same thing with the differentiators. It wasn't, I don't even think we had differentiators. We, we did it. Yeah. And when Liz asked us, I'm like, I don't know. And then when we started talking about it, you're like, wait, there's a common theme yeah. here. Specifically, number one, um, Xavier is very good. That's something he's brought from the beginning. He he talks to clients um, just very straightforward because we're not going to lie to you. And we're going to tell you what you need to hear because we educate you through that process. So those are, those I like those. Yeah. Those are my new favorites, the differentiators. <laughs> so the differentiators are, we tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. We keep you informed every step of the way. We never compromise quality for price. Correct. So, yeah, and it's, you know, when you're working with um, industry, sometimes it's like, well, how am I different? But when you really start doing that, that work and, you know, the answers are always in the room, right? It's yes. just a matter of really digging, digging deep because they're there. and and then they surface and, and, and once they surface and you're aligned with them, you're like, then you put, you know, life into them. And now it's part of, that's part of their talking points when they're doing sales, right? right? They, it's part of who they are because that's, it's always been a part of it. Now it's just really, it's, it's formalized. It's written. It's part it's, of their material. Exactly. One of the, one of our favorite things to do is to be hired by a general contractor and have them send us a set of plans. And we're like, guys, this isn't approved in Miami-Dade County. It's not going to work because the water slopes this way. So we had already, we proposed systems that are better, even they're more expensive. So number three, the compromise quality for price, we had already been doing it, but we didn't, we didn't know yeah. until it was, you know, we did went through that exercise. You, you know, you're actually bringing up a really important point. You know, this is obviously where BizHack shines, you know, marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing that's interesting is you're talking about the purchaser, the end user, the, the, the owner. Um, but there's another target market of yours, right, which is the general contractor who hires you. Right. And I'm curious, generally speaking, are you hired direct hire by by homeowners? Or are you hired, like what percentage of the time is it direct hire versus through a GC? You know, GCs are, are um, we love them, but um, we've been the GC and then now we're the sub. And so one of the things I've learned through EOS is that I align myself um, not only with, with the, the right customers, but I also align myself with the right vendors and the right GCs um, that live the core values we do. Mm -hmm. And so um, right now we're about, I would say 85%, 80% uh, retail private clients and then 20% GCs um, because the GCs, you know, are, are difficult bunch to, to align with sometimes. So, yeah. So let me, let me just put this in marketing terms for folks. So there, there's two models that are actually being pursued simultaneously here by Michelle. One is a what's known as a B2C model, which is the homeowner purchases directly roof fixes from Michelle. Um, and the kind of marketing you need to do to get retail homeowners to purchase from you is very different than having relationships with a general contractor who then subs out the work to you. Generally speaking, in a company, a, an industry like roofing, 
the the margins, the amount of profit you make when it's a direct hire is going to be higher than through the GC because the GC as the middleman's taking essentially a referral fee from you. But it takes less marketing because you only have to market to a handful of GCs and you pretty much know a whole all who all of them are. And so you don't need to invest as much in marketing, but what Michelle is sort of saying here is I prefer to take the route of more marketing and retail where we're do doing homeowners. You know, the issue is generally speaking, a homeowner doesn't need a new roof except every 10 years uh, or 30 years, you know, depending on the kind of building. And so the challenge there, of course, is you, you, you close somebody and then you're really just relying, they're not going to buy again for a while, but they might refer you. So, so your strategy is really going to be heavy on referrals. Anyway, mm -hmm. just wanted to give a little bit of marketing strategy uh, to this uh, marketing strategy overview. I did wonder about proven process and guarantee. Are you still working on those areas? We're working on the guarantee. Yeah, yeah. we're working on the guarantee. So that's we're not... Toying around with a couple of different concepts. Right. Perfect. Yeah. So we're yeah, so, so according to like EOS, you sh the, the a full marketing strategy has these four elements. Um, and I, I, part of the reason why I really like that you haven't defined that is because it's a lot of work. A lot of work goes into every word that's here, hours and hours and weeks and weeks. It's not just like you sit down and figure it out. It's no. you kind of spitball something and then you live it for a while and you realize, oh, that's not quite right. And part of EOS is every quarter you review this and make changes. And then every year you do like a deep dive. And the, the point is that done is better than perfect right? Like it's better that she has two of the four filled out and is living by those and whereas knows it like, okay, in the next three to six months, we're going to figure out the rest rather than trying to make it perfect at the start and never getting it done. So now I'd like for you to share your five-year target and your three-year vision. Yeah. So going through EOS, um, my, my visionary, it was funny because my visionary Xavier when we sat down to, to get to this part of the exercise, he's like, oh, we're going to be here. We're going to be there. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, where did this come from? How I didn't even know. And so, um, you know, the importance of a visionary, because as an integrator, I look at things very black and white. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not there. I'm, I'm still over here, you know, trying to set up the systems and the processes. So our five year target is to open four new locations in Florida by the end of 2028 Our our sec we were already in the works for our second one in Southwest Florida. Um, and then once you do your five-year target, you start really big. And then Liz walked us through getting very granular at, at the bottom. You know, um, that did take us a lot of time. Yeah. We didn't finish the three in the one year um, because it was it's it's a lot. It's multi-site. It's it's how much does each roof cost me? So there's a lot of like math. What what are we doing now? What's our average price? And so we were able to, at our second go at it, we were able to do the three year uh, vision, which is 300 new roofs um, a year. And it looks like two locations, the sales manager running our team of roofologists, it's six new roofologists on the sales team. It's the clearly outlined accountability chart with roles and responsibilities. And then just five, the processes followed by all, like the repeatable process that everybody's on board with. Well, there's more, right? I think there's more in the next page. Maybe on the next slide. That was our one year. Okay. Goal, okay. Right. So. And then you go down, you know, we go from five to three to one year. So awesome. one year is, is two roofs. And then a lot of the hiring happens in one year for us. Yeah. And now, so we're now going from the world of vision to the world of traction in the vision traction organizer. So this is now going to start getting kind of granular and frankly, a little boring for the average person. So with your permission, I'll just kind of run through these slides myself, because what is here is actually not that relevant to most of us. The idea, though, is the format of it, because, you know, this is their strategy. It, it fits on one page. What, what I think makes EOS so special and better than, frankly, any other system is how simple it is. It is not, it is a lot of work, but it's less work than any of the other systems that are out there. And I, I gotta do this, because I'm gonna mention EOS's biggest competitor now, but this book, Scaling Up, is one of the Bibles of operating systems. And 
you'll see if you can read it here, it says people, strategy, execution, and cash. Well, Gino was a kind of acolyte of Vern's. He, he actually helped start the EO chapter, Entrepreneurs Organization chapter in Detroit. And I got to tell you, as complicated and difficult as traction sometimes is, this is 10 times harder. Well, it's interesting you say that because I have a client that I'm just starting to work with who was on scaling up. And what she loved about the EOS system and the reason she she, she moved over to EOS is because of all the tools mm -hmm. and the simplicity of the tools. Because even though she had all these other things in place, to your point, a lot of them have very similar, right? forms in terms of the, the, what those pieces are, but it's the, the simple tools. And that's what resonated with me because I'm a get to the point kind of person. And I don't, I, I mean, I'm a bullet get to the point kind of person, less is more. And so that, I think that's the appeal to a lot of people about EOS is the, it's the simplicity to work smarter and not harder in a way which, which is manageable. And, and I just want you guys to know, like, that's not a sales pitch. That's just no, reality. It's reality. <laughs> yeah. it's reality. EOS is simpler. And I'll be honest, sometimes it doesn't actually address issues that come up, especially with larger businesses. And that's why it's good to be aware of both yeah. because there's some tools in scaling up that EOS is sort of quiet on, especially when you deal with sections like cash, right? Which EOS is pretty quiet about. So EOS is something that I really hold dear to my heart, which is, you know, there's that great quote, I think it's by Oscar Wilde, which is, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to write a shorter letter. <laughs> the idea is that simplicity is hard. And I learned this when I spent 10 years working for public radio. And I had to boil down complex business news stories in 30 seconds without oversimplifying. In many ways, what I think that EOS, what I think when I think of what I'm trying to do at BizHack is I'm trying to do for marketing what Gino has done for business operating systems, which is give you a simpler but not oversimplified set of tools, structures, and frameworks to allow you to grow faster. So every system, whether it's scaling up, Pinnacle, um, EOS, they basically say you need to figure out your one-year goals um, and the format changes, but they basically are like, what, you know, what is your revenue going to be in one year? What's your profitability going to be in one year? How are, what is your main KPIs or key performance indicators called measurable? And then what are like the high level goals? You know, usually five to seven uh, goals that you want to accomplish in the year. And then you say, okay, in order to kind of break that down, how do you get there this quarter? Like, what do you need to do this quarter to get there uh, by the end of the year? And you only plan in quarterly chunks. You don't plan all four quarters. You just plan the next quarter. Um, and this is called the 90-day world. You know, the idea is that human beings cannot really keep more than 90 days of, of activity in their brain or things start to go haywire. And it's funny, like, at the end of the 90 days, at the end of the quarter, I find my focus is lost, like I'm starting to not feel kind of totally confident in what I'm up to, and I need to like get back together the team and we need to refresh and reset for the next quarter. It's an incredible thing, and, and, and Gino talks about this kind of almost human, it's almost like in built, in, built in us, like we really can't as human beings like think beyond three months in terms of activities. And so that, that there, there's a reason that business is organized in quarters in three month increments. And this system follows that same idea. Um, and the, the one thing I will say is every system out there more or less does the same thing. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Liz, to talk about people. So the people component, yeah, well, again, you can't build a great company without great people, right? And so what does that, what do great people look like in your organization? That's the, that's the piece that we started working on the vision. What are the values, right? What are the behaviors, characteristics of your A players? And we go through this exercise actually, where we say, okay, if you had this person, or there could be more than one person, right, in it, who's in your team that you, if you had more, if you had a, a team of them, you could take over the world, right? 
that's 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 really like that's kind of your avatar and you start looking at what is it about them what are their what are, how do they behave what are the, what's so what's so what makes them such a, a special uh, employee right and you kind of break it down into those behaviors you put action to them and those are called right people right people that fit your culture that that are aligned in the values and we have a tool that we call a people analyzer where we make it very black and white and we put I don't know if you want to share the people analyzer but what we do is we actually go through an exercise where we put all your values on top and then you know, when I'm working with the leadership team, we we put the leadership team and then we rate ourselves. Are we living these values? How are we doing? And then and then we start looking outside of the leadership team. And you use this tool to really be able to gauge our well, you're getting ahead. <laughs> are these are these the right people, right? Because if you have someone who is mostly negative and you create your own bar, right? What is something you absolutely will not tolerate? You will, you will you know, you will not, you, you will you'll fire someone for it, right? What is it? Um, so you create that baseline and then you you go through the exercise of seeing where where the people fall in your, in your organization. And then that's also an opportunity to have conversations because in this particular case, Jalen, for instance, the help first and do the right thing is negative. Well, if he's not if he's not exemplifying these behaviors consistently, one, we have a conversation. Is there something going on? Do you have your tools of support? Or is it just this person is not the right fit? And then that's a decision that needs to be made because what you don't want is you don't want, I call them culture killers, because even if you don't see it, they are intoxicating. They're, they're being toxic to your organization. And so those people need to be removed. Um, we're, I'm, I'm very, I'm personally very adamant about it because I've, I've seen it firsthand. I've, I've grown several companies and, uh, and the wrong people could definitely hurt a culture. So that's the right people. Then we have the right seats, which is, this is where we do the accountability chart. Every, every business, right, has a, a structure, but we assume that everyone has sales and marketing operations and finance, but we customize it to your needs. Operations could be field operations and admin operations. Finance could in, include HR and IT, depending on your business, right? And we kind of, we look ahead a year from now, what does that need to look like for you to get to the one, your vision? And so we, we look at these functions, we create those functions, but as you can see, we don't put people in them. First, we just put the structure. We don't, we're not talking about people at this point. Um, and then every organization we say, you know, has, needs to have an integrator, right? Which is the person who's really making sure the day-to-day -day that the, the other uh, functions have the resources, tools, and support to execute on the vision, right? And then 50% of the time you have companies that have an integrator, uh, who plays visionary, who plays the integrator, and like you were doing, Dan, and then the other 50% actually have the difference between, a, you know, the visionary and the integrator. And as you mentioned early on, very, very different, right? Visionaries are creative, big relationships, you know, strategic growth. They're, they're, they're not the detailed day-to-day -day person. That's your integrator. And so ideally, right, in EOS, we want to have both. We want to have a visionary and we want to have a digital integrator because that that definitely uh, lends itself to a lot faster uh, as far as execution, <laughs> less chaos, right? Um, so then what we do is- um, well, one, one quick thing. Um, so, you know, the, the visionary, um, is the you often the big ideas person? It doesn't mean they're the only person with big ideas. No, no, no. But, but the integrator is really the one who manages the full business and executes against it. And That's I'm curious, true. Michelle, um, Xavier is your husband, right? Yes. So let's talk just really quickly. You don't have to tell us all your marital secrets. I was uh, like, how much but, time do we have, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very interested in this relationship between the visionary and the integrator. It, it often is a husband-wife. And uh, I'm just interested in hearing, you know, in, in family-run businesses, uh, just how that's working out for you. And and like before you were both co-running the business, but you didn't have these labels. And so I'm just kind of curious how just even having the labels has has impacted or helped. 
Um, yeah. So now that we have the labels, it all makes sense. I mean, between Xavier and I, it's going really, really, really well. I mean, we check in on each other a lot, you know, um, and we always make sure that, that, you know, we're, we're, we're aligned, right? I couldn't do, do what I do now without him. And, and he feels the same way, or at least he tells me, he feels that way. <laughs> but very early on, what we decided is that we took it. I see a lot of people that are husband and wife and they start a business. They don't treat it like a business. Um, and so very early on, we had position descriptions, very rudimentary. It wasn't anything professional. I, I tell him, I'm like, here's your list. Stay in your lane. This is how you make me money. <laughs> don't come into my lane and I won't go. I don't go into the sales. I can't sell and he can't organize. And so as long as, you know, we tell each other, we're like, stay in your lane. And, you know, since we started that from the beginning, he knows what that means and, and vice versa. And so a lot of the beginning was like, I'm talking to you as your business partner, not as your wife. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times when there's a personal relationship, you just feel that comfort to go into that. And so we practiced that very, very early on, which was very easy because it was him and I, it wasn't a team. And I feel like it really built us for success because now that we have that team of 10 to 15, you know, depending on the size of the project, um, we're able to carry that on because in interviewing a lot of team members for the team, a lot of people leave small businesses because of the, the toxicity of the owners bringing it into the business. So we were, and now you have each other. Exactly. And now, I mean, if you look at our disc assessment, like I'm a high D, a high I, he's an S and a C. So we're the perfect marriage and business partner aligned. And now that there's, there are these labels of visionary integrator, it just makes so much sense where he's, he's in Tampa, he's in Panama city, he's in Fort Myers and I'm in Miami, like, wait a second, mm -hmm. you know, we're still trying to figure it out. So it, it, it it's yeah. worked out really great. Yeah. You know, we're not going to have time to go through this whole thing, well, but yeah, we don't need to go through it. But I think what's important to talk about is, you know, you've got the functions, but then you have to put the five key roles and responsibility. What are the main roles, responsibilities of this role? And that's where it becomes transparency starts coming up, right? Because no matter who sits in that seat, that's what that seat is responsible for. Right. And so then we plug in the people. And once we plug in the people, we do we 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 do a, a evaluation right there and then. It's like, are these the right seats for these people? Right. Are they sitting in the right seat? Or what's and, the missing gap? Or, or exactly like, what are the gaps? What do we need? Because sometimes what happens is you have one person sitting in multiple seats, which happens all the time in small businesses. And you, we start identifying what are the most important hires, right? To fill like up in order for us to grow, right? In order for us to achieve the, the vision. So it, it serves for, for multi-purposes, right? So it's, it creates transparency of like, there are gaps, right? There are two, one person can't do all these things and there's no way that you're gonna have quality if you're spread out that thin. And also sometimes you have someone sitting in the wrong seat, right? The seat could be too big for them, right? And they're over their heads or it's too small, they're not challenged enough. And what happens then is you lose people if you don't have those conversations and you offer them career growth or, or just understand what they want, right? Um, and then actually, Dan, if we could go to the other slide with the, not the M3 slide, but the other slide so that we could see the GWC. Um, sorry, so the, the yeah, so we, we talked about the function and we, then we put the name and then what we do is we say, we say, do they get it? Okay. Do they have the skill set for the job? Do they want it? And do they have the capacity to do it? And you need to have all three because I had in, in particular in your organization, you had somebody who got the job. They understood it. They got the, they had the skill set. They had the capacity, but they didn't want it. Right. And she was, she actually verbalized. I don't really want this job. And so she was a winner, right? She was somebody that was an ideal person in your organization. So how do, what, what seat? Because you're growing. So is there a seat for her? And then we work towards that seat. Mm -hmm. But it's really important that you, these three get answered yes, yes, yes. Or you may have somebody who has, who gets it, who wants it and doesn't have the capacity. They're already like too, too, too spread out, you know, and they're not going to do a great job. So um, that's the importance of that GWC and having, having the right people in the right seat. So the right people, again, goes, it's about culture, culture fit. Right seat is about really having someone sitting in the seat that is the right fit for them, that 
they're going to excel in and you get the greatest value as an employer and they feel satisfied as an employee. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't tell you how powerful tool this GWC is. Um, it's not enough that they are a culture fit, that they have your core values. Mm -hmm. It is a, it, it does, however, uh, disqualify them if they don't share your core values. However, people who share your core values still need to understand the role that they're in, mm -hmm. want to be in that role, and have the ability to do that role, both capacity wise. Um, you know, and uh, in knowledge wise, but also, you know, they need to have the time to do it. So what you might find, for instance, is if you like look back at the at the chart, you know, Michelle was all over the place, right? Um, that, that, <laughs> That's, that was evident. It's like, Michelle, Michelle, it's like, okay, we got to fix yeah, this. <laughs> so, so you can see right now that, so Michelle's the integrator, she's managing marketing, accounting, sales and human resources and operations. And then she's also acting as a field operation and production coordinator, right? So she's like deep, 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 deep in the weeds uh, when it comes to these jobs. Um, similarly, you know, Xavier is not only like the big relationship visionary type, but he's also in a very kind of ground level sales role. And oh, by the way, most companies sub five, $10 million the head of sales is the CEO oftentimes because that, that uh, the, the, there are a lot of reasons for this, but the main one is they would have never gotten to one to $5 million if they didn't have a good salesman running the company, yeah. right? That, that salesperson, that, that is often the reason why they're, they're the personality uh, of a visionary CEO often lends itself to a sales role, whereas the operate, the operations uh, are often an area of weakness for many visionaries. Anyway, um, let's move on so we can cover all the areas, but um, GWC is an incredibly powerful one. Let's now talk about- uh, No, we, have to, we, we missed data. We missed data, that's important, real quick. So the uh, data component- I don't have the slide, but go ahead. Okay, well, the data component, again, it's about really having those numbers that give you a pulse on the business. And it's really important. I can tell you personally, that behavioral company we were growing, we were growing so fast. We did everything on gut. What do you think? What do you think? Because we didn't have time. And yes. Michelle can relate to that. We didn't have time to like really sit down and figure out like what are the numbers that drive our business? So if Michelle and Xavier are on vacation and they get a report, this scorecard really gives them, they know like what, what is going on in their business. And it's a based on 13 weeks. So it also gives you the ability to predict, to plan, right? Mm -hmm. To see trends. These are all really, really important because you can't, and again, you can't fix what you can't measure. So in order for you to really understand uh, the levers and how to grow your business mm -hmm. and, and how to respond when your business is maybe not doing well in an area is to know those numbers. So that's the scorecard. And we look at that scorecard weekly, and but then on a 13-week basis, right? Week one quarterly, and then measurables, right? So essentially everyone in the in the company should have at least one or two measurables. Like what is what is um what does great look like in that position? What is what is a successful day in that position, right? Um and we can move on to the next one. So I was just going to say really quickly, because data is my favorite one. <laughs> so when we have our weekly meetings, what it looks like is our measurables, the input, the information. And if you could imagine like whatever your measurables are, whatever you want to measure. And then there's like green, red, green, red, green, red. So it's a super quick opportunity yeah. for the leadership to come together every Monday. We look at it and we're like, all right, everything's green, green, red. Like why, for how long? Then we have our own system. And so... One of my goals is to spend the summers with the kids, right? And so that's going to help me as we get better at this weekly check-in, like everything's good. Oh, everything's not good. And then yes. understand why and how and where to go. Yeah. So that's. Yeah. And it takes part. a little while to get right. the scorecard just right. It's a, it's a work in progress, usually two to three months sometimes. Sometimes, you know, right. it's sooner depending on how ready you are. Um, okay, so we talked about vision, we talked about people, we talked about data. This is where the transparency comes up, right? Getting all that stuff from your head down on paper and then doing what we call the IDS, which we'll talk about a little deeper, but um, I want I want, I want want uh, Michelle to talk about this because this is, this is where a lot of people struggle. They have everything in their head and also struggle with meetings that there's a lot of discussion, but there's real no solutions, right? And solving problems is a direct correlate. There's a direct correlation between 
problem solving and success, right? Being having a successful business. The better you are at, at, at solving problems and making them go away for good, the more successful your business will be, right? Because what happens is that we put bandits on them and then they just keep coming back if we don't really solve them. Right. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, issues. So, you know, at our level 10 meetings or at our leadership meetings that we host every Monday and, and the leadership team is present, um, what I, we discuss these issues and there's a time, there's 60 minutes and everybody lists their issues that they have in the week. So this week, if there is something that has arised that has either stopped the team member from doing their job or a customer has complained about or a systems process issue, they can list it on the app. We use the attraction tool website yeah. um, and um, we can discuss that as a leadership team and do something about it. Because I feel a lot as a, as a business, I was constantly being interrupted with issues. Like, hey, this isn't working. Hey, this customer said this. And I'm like, I I'm I'm doing my job right now. I, I don't have, and then you feel bad. I don't have time or it's not a priority. You want to make sure your team members are heard. So, you know, putting our issues on this one website and having this designated time to to identify them, to discuss it, and then actually solve it. Like there, a solution comes from it, and then we create to-dos around it. Like someone gets assigned an assignment to 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 solve it. And so it just, it gives us an opportunity to make sure that, you know, um, problems are being solved and yeah. team members are being heard and, and things are moving forward. Yeah. And those, you know, you want to put, as, as Michelle mentioned, those issues that come up during the week, but also what are the things that are getting in the way of us achieving, right? right our quarterly goals and then feed into our one-year goals. Like we prioritize them. So we take three at a time, right? And we discuss them. And sometimes you get through more, sometimes you get through less, depending on, you know, the, the extent of the issue, sometimes it just, you have to, you know, it's, it merits a, a longer discussion and that's okay. So that's just an example. So we talked about identify, discuss, and solve. And, and the identify, you know, we, we really want to get dig deep to get to the core of the issue, because sometimes people, what they bring up is a result of the real issue, right? Mm -hmm. Not the core issue. And so we say, well, we dig, because we wanna make sure that we, we have a solve for the core issue, not the result of the issue, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, you really wanna do what's called a root cause analysis. Exactly. And that's what we discuss it is. So exactly. uh, process. So process basically is just taking those, you know, core processes and documenting them in a simpler way, right? That 20% 20 20 of the 80% creating master checklist, and these are typically your core processes you see in, in, in most companies. But again, we customize those, right? Depending on your business, but these are generally speaking what the, the what most companies have. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's the part, that's usually a, a difficult one for people. <laughs> so that's why we keep it simple because people get very, very stuck with creating these big manuals and uh, they never get done or they, they get done and then they never get used. So. Anyway, and then make sure that it's followed by all because it's really, really important, right? That you just don't document these things, but they're actually followed by all because that's the only thing that's going to create consistency, doing the doing it the best way possible every single time for consistency, manageability, which in turn results in profitability. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. That's why I and again, I can tell you personally, like it's so easy to, to have someone trained a certain way, then somebody comes in, does it a different way, mm -hmm. and then they train that person a different way. And before you know it, it's gotten away from you. And that can affect your profitability and also creates a lot more chaos in the organization mm -hmm. when you hire someone training. So, um, I mean, I, I, I know we're, I'm being mindful of time here, so I don't want to get too much into it. So traction is about execution, right? We talked about that and we talked about the um, discipline, instilling discipline and accountability. So we talk about the rocks, so that 90 day world. And to your point, Dan, you know, I always get the, uh, the, the visual of like going through a jungle with a machete and you're, you know, you're cutting a path, right? Every so often you need to go above the trees, look behind, make sure that, you know, the path was, mm -hmm. it was, you know, you're straight on the path and then that you're going to keep going on that right path. So that 90 world day world is super important. Um, cause we want to look back and we want to look ahead, right. And plan ahead. And then the meeting pulse, right. We said, this is a non-negotiable and these are the weekly level 10 meetings It's same day, same time, start on time end on time, same agenda. Mm -hmm. And we're super, super, we, we, uh, we're very strict about this because 
what happens a lot is like people, oh no, I can't make it this week. And you know, if you're going to stay aligned, you've got to commit unless you're on vacation or God forbid you're ill or something, but otherwise there is no excuse not to be in that meeting. And it starts, if you say it's going to start at nine o'clock, nine o'clock, you start the meeting. If the person is, if somebody didn't make it, they need to, you know, it's, they need to be held accountable. Exactly. So anyway, that's the meeting pulse. And then the level 10 meeting, right? What we do here, um, the first part of the meeting, well, first we do a little icebreaker, best, you know, best personal news, best professional news you want to share for this week. Then it's just, it's a reporting, the scorecard. We look at the scorecard, Michelle mentioned it late earlier, it's red and green, right? So red means not good, right? So we say on track or off track. If it's off track and you want to discuss it, we say drop it down to discussion. We don't discuss it at that point. Then we do the same thing with rock review, on track, off track, or done, right? And if, if there's a need to discuss it, we drop it down to discussion. So at this point, you're just reporting. And then customer employee headlines, it could be shout outs. It could be a customer testimonial. It could be someone is going on maternity leave and we need to find a replacement or whatever that headline is that you need to share with the team that then gets trickled out. Um, that's the time to do it. And then you review the to-do list. And this is done, not done. And typically these to-do lists come from the prior week of your solving issues. Like Michelle said, you walk away with to-dos and this creates accountability, right? Mm -hmm. So that week after week, there's that discipline of that, that level 10 meeting, right? When we just talked about the meeting pulse. And then there's the accountability piece. Because what's going to happen is if you're, if you get those to-dos done, right? what you're going to do is you're executing mm -hmm. every there's execution mm -hmm. and there's accountability because if the person doesn't execute on it well we need to figure out what's going on right um so then you spend the crust of the meeting doing what we call idsing which is discussing the issues and solving them and that's 60 minutes of that and then you conclude right you wrap up you wrap up the to-dos you make sure everybody's clear on what their to-dos are because they're due the following week um, and you always rate the meeting. And the reason for that is you want to see how do we do as a leadership team, as a leadership team or as a team, because you want to roll these out later on by department. And what that means, were we open and honest? Were we, did we, you know, did we start, did we discuss in a healthy way or did we politicize or did we, you know, did, was there like, how did we do? Right. Because you want to make sure that you have healthy conflict, but you want to be solving issues. Right. So, um, beginning i think they're a little hard right i mean they, i want to talk to you though. they are hard because as you can see every option every item has minutes like five minutes four minutes and you don't realize how quickly the time goes and so um at the beginning it's hard to stay on track but once you practice it we've been doing it now for yeah. six seven months um it's so easy because the whole team not only myself but the whole team wants to get to the ids section yeah. they're like you know they're like okay good news scorecard all those things and then they know that like that's the meat of the yeah. of the com of the of the meeting because because traction happens there yeah thing you know um get yeah, done so, get yeah. solved in that time and that feels good right? right everybody wants to feel good everyone wants to know that they're doing a good job that they're executing that you're fixing problems um, people get frustrated when, you know, problems just keep recycling. Yes. It's very frustrating for yes. people. And the reason that this part is difficult with the reporting is because people are inclined to want to talk in the beginning about yes. something that's not okay. Right. And so really that's a, that's what it is. It's, it's really about wanting to talk about it um, and having the discipline to say, no, we're not discussing now. We're dropping it down to, to the issues list. Correct. Yeah. So that's really the, the, the six components and all the tools. And then this is the journey, right? So it starts with typically I do a 90 day, you know, as implementers, we do a 90 day meeting where we, we walk you through this, right? What kind of what we just did, but I do it in a little, little more detail. Um, and then the first day, as you can see, we start already like getting into action. We, we talk about the concept of hitting the ceiling, which every company goes through. I'm not going to get too much into it. Um, accountability chart. We start building your accountability chart. Mm -hmm. We start creating your rocks. We we start the meeting pulses, right? So that next week you start that level 10 meeting, you start practicing and we start your first round of the scorecard. So this gives you an opportunity to start that rhythm, right? And there's a reason why this happens before vision. We want you to start getting into the mindset of 
discipline, accountability before we go into the vision building. And then the vision building, and Michelle alluded to it earlier, it's a lot of work. So it takes two days because you're really digging deep. It, a lot of these things, like when people first see them, oh, core values, yeah, we have core values. Oh, we know what we do. But when you really start probing and doing that discovery, you realize like, wow, okay, I guess we weren't yeah, that clear. Right. And so we want to really create some clarity and, and walk away with something that feels really, right. uh, you know, you're aligned and tangible. Yes. And then, and then we go into quarterlies um, and then the annual planning um, that usually, you know, it's a two day, um, two day annual planning. So we look for the, we look ahead for the rest of the year and that's it. That's, that's all it is. <laughs> so I don't know if we have time for questions. I know we kind of ran long. No, no, we're doing perfect. Um, okay. we, we, this was really intended as a, as a case study uh, that kind of shows sort of the full example of the process um, so, you know, a, a personal reflection is, um, as a self-implementer, so this, th that process that she just walked you through, Liz walked you through, um, uh, is what, if you want to hire a professional implementer to do it for you, um, you can really kind of get rolling in, you know, six months, uh, 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 like 60 days, um, and really have a really good vision, traction is in place. Um, for self-implementation, it usually takes two to three quarters. So instead of a 60-day process, you're talking about a six to nine-month process. As business owners, we're always making trade-offs between time and money. And what we had to choose at BizHack was because we were not in a position to be able to hire a consultant. We traded fast implementation of EOS for uh, doing it ourselves and doing it a little slower. And it's worked out great for us. So everybody's sort of at a different place. Um, Michelle is a larger company than us. Michelle was a further along than us. How long has your business been in place? Um, we've been in construction for 10 years now. Yeah. And you also have three generations behind you. So two <laughs> generations behind you of, of construction. So, so whereas I'm just sort of five years in the industry. So uh, for every business, the, the route is different, but what's really nice is these tools are, are, are available to you. You're going to be all getting follow-up email uh, for, for those of you who attended live with some additional tools. You can also go to the EOS website and get a lot of them yourself. One thing that I wanted to say is that when I read Traction as a marketer, I noticed that there's only really that marketing strategy section. It represents about five pages of the book. But I know from having worked with hundreds, if not thousands of businesses, that, that isn't enough, right? Just having the marketing strategy still doesn't tell you what channels you should advertise on and how to communicate with your target customer. And in many ways, what I think of the BizHack lead building system is like if Gino Wickman were to write a book on marketing, that's the book he would write. And so we actually use the level 10 marketing EOS, I'm sorry, the EOS methodology, but at the marketing level. So we basically, for our clients, run marketing level 10 meetings. And it's working out great where we set marketing rocks. We use other assessments and tools to figure out what those rocks should be. But we follow the format of that level 10 meeting uh, with adaptations. We incorporate some other methodologies like Scrum, uh, but we uh, adapt the, the traction methodology, which is really about how to run a company. And we adapt it to how to run the marketing department. And it's working out great and our clients love it. So thank you guys so much, uh, Michelle and Liz, amazing. Uh, congratulations on the recognition um, and uh, best of luck for continued success and growth. They're great and students, though. Yeah. <laughs> they do everything they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to say, based uh, Dan, on what you just said, I think as business owners, we're so busy running our business and working in it. I think committing to working on it, which we learned yeah. a little bit at Goldman Sachs, dedicating time, whether it's self-implemented or with a coach specifically, but uh, uh, deciding to actively work on it instead of in it all the time, just even just a little bit yeah. makes a huge difference. 100%. Yeah. You know, you, you, they, they, there's that uh, Michael Gerson, you know, from the e uh Revisited always says you need to learn how to work 
on your business and not in it. Yeah. Well, Even, you want your business working for you, not you working for your business is what I would say, right? <laughs> there you go. And, you know, even Michelle. I've done it both ways. I, I prefer my, running my business. I mean, uh, my, my business working for me. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. Let's everybody, let's make a goal in 2023 to have our businesses work for us. Yes. Have a good one. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. And uh, we're going to take the Thanksgiving holiday off and we'll see you guys again after Thanksgiving, where we're going to continue on how to prepare for the coming recession. See you there. Thank you.